Welcome to the Heal with Kelly podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gorse, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. Thank you for joining me on this beautiful journey of remembering our divine nature and tapping into the truths that shall set us free. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Heal with Kelly podcast. Welcome back if you've been with us before. I'm so excited to welcome our amazing guest, (laughs) beaming over here, uh, Dr. Michael Gervais. And I'll tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Michael Gervais is a high-performance psychologist, national best-selling author, and one of the world's leading experts on the relationship between the mind and human performance. Over the course of a 20-year career working with world-class performers and organizations, Dr. Gervais has developed a framework for the mental skills and practices that allow organizations, teams, and individuals to thrive in pressure-packed environments. The bio goes on and on and on, but we'll just dive right into the conversation because what I am really interested in is all of it, but this book that he recently wrote, it was released last year, this year? It was. The First Rule of Mastery, Stop Worrying About What People Think of You. I mean, this probably should become my Bible because that's my (laughs) biggest issue holding me back. (laughs) Kelly, thank you for the warm welcome and thank you for the the kind words. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, yeah, so FOPO, Fear of Other People's Opinions. Yeah, it was was just a fun, like FOMO inspired me, that idea of like, I think most of us can recognize and I thought but that's not really my fear it's not I'm not afraid of missing out and I thought if I were to change it what would I change it to and it really is the fear of people's opinions and um, that's been with me for a long time and then I wrote a simple little three-page article for Harvard Business Review and they called back 12 months later and they said "Um, you were the number one downloaded article for 12 months in a row let's take it a little further. Wow. And so that's that that's the origin fun story about how this book came to be and how the concept came to be. Have you cured your FOPO or is it an ongoing unraveling? Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, this book is not for the narcissist. It's not for the sociopath. It's not for the fully enlightened. You know, this is like for the rest of us that are trying to figure out how to be just a little bit better, how to be more connected. Um, how to be more full of ourselves on a daily basis. And, you know, I, I don't think there's a cure to it, but I think understanding it. And I believe, based on my research, that it is the greatest constrictor for most of us, meaning that the most dangerous thing for most of us, there are very th- physically dangerous environments that we can go into. Um, but for most of us, we, we don't have physical violence as part of our experience. There certainly is abuse is is, I'm not mitigating or downplaying abuse in our lives, but the 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 eyeballs and what's behind the eyeballs of other people, what are they thinking about me, tends to be one of the great fears for people. And it's shown up um, for me. And like at first I first noticed when I was 15 years old Mm. and I was like, what am I doing? Why am I playing a part? Why am I trying to look cool rather than just be myself? Like what's wrong with me? just being me why do I need to act a certain way as a teenager for them whoever them is to think that I'm okay and I was so embarrassed by it because I knew that that's not the right way and and then it happened when I was 16 and I was driving I just I just saved up for my first car and I was driving down the street it was on Pacific Coast Highway not too far from here and and I thought okay here I go that there's a car passing me in the same direction and I thought, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna straighten up, and I'm gonna put. I grabbed one hand on the steering wheel as if it like the cool kid <laughs> lean, you know, right? And I thought they're gonna see me and think like, oh, this kid's cool. It was a B- Mazda B2000 pickup <laughs> truck. Okay, so it was everything I had at the time, and so, and I, I looked out of the corner of my eye to tr- try to catch their eye. This is like six days into me being 16, and I, and I thought they didn't even look at me like. And, and that was the lightning bolt moment that I thought, what am I doing? Why am I so connected to wanting to look and be accepted and be thought of a certain way rather than just being me? And I was so embarrassed by it because who's, who's going to go to their friend group and say, hey, I got to 
tell you about this thing yeah, that I'm yeah. doing. I'm trying to look cool. And, you know, you get pushed right out quickly. But um, <laughs> and then I recognized that early on, like um, in my career working with World's Best, they have it, too. So for the first time when I started working with World's Best, I was like, oh, I'm not alone. So they say things a little bit differently. They didn't have that story, but they say, when I ask what the great fears that they're working on, um, they say it's not getting hurt. It's like letting people down. Mm -hmm. It's uh, looking stupid in front of 80,000 people. It's letting my agent down, my dad down, my wife down, my whomever, letting the fans down, my teammates down. So it really is about the way that people will feel in relationship to my performance, my contribution the way that I'm adding to. And so I wanted to understand that better. Like, what is this thing that we carry around with us? And apparently it's pretty pervasive. It is pretty pervasive. It's pretty amazing too that you casually say it and it makes sense that you went into the field of psychology, but for a 16 year old to be that self-aware, yeah, right. you yeah. know, when everything is so heightened as an adolescent and hormones and <clears throat> It's just, that's pretty cool that you were, had, can even remember that moment of self-reflection. Yeah, I, you know, I, th I think about that too. And it wasn't until I got a little older, I realized like, why was I like that as a kid? And um, dad's an alcoholic drug addict, was recovering. Hmm. Mom was codependent. And so she made everything look just about perfect. And dad was a mess, as fun as a human could be. And sometimes really scary. So that's kind of the, the way that I grew up. Sometimes like when my friends were at home, um, when I was again a teenager, the, the garage door would open and you'd see their eyes like, which dad are we getting? Mm. And so um, I needed to get to the truth. Yeah, I didn't know what it was. And so I've made a promise to my son to not make the same mistakes, but I'm, I'm going to make new ones. And so <laughs> like, that's what drove me. I, I just wanted the like psychology is the study of yourself. It's the study of other people. But first and foremost, it's like, understand the theories. You're the first subject. Like, does this theory hold up for me? And then pretty soon you're like, wow, I've got all of these disorders, <laughs> you know? Right? <laughs> and then, but really it's the study. Psychology is the study of like yourself and other people. And it's a great I think it's one of the most beautiful sciences. Mm. It's invisible, it's hard, it's complex, um, but the practices are quite simple. And I'm fascinated, that's really what elite athletes, which is my kind of my first training ground, is they are concrete. They, want, they don't wanna get lost in all of the, like, tell me about the times when, you know, like yeah. they don't wanna get too lost. They're like, listen, I gotta go on Sunday and I got to do something that's really challenging and high stress and high pressure, like help me, mm -hmm. like be my best. So they, they, they're looking for very concrete practices to help them be better. So I love mm -hmm. those, you know, tangible things that we can do every day. Yeah, I love psychology too. And I remember going to Berkeley and not knowing what I was going to study. And so I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna study a plethora and see, because I have so many interests. and. Uh, make sure that they all satisfy a UC requirement because I'm performance, you know, achievement. <laughs> you, like, did I, you grow up in a high stress family? I did. Very yeah. similar to yours, except different circumstances. My dad was military, raised, he was raised by a marine alcoholic. So his expectations of himself were very high and highly mm. critical, highly judgmental. And, um, and he was a pilot, so he was gone two weeks out of the month, which gave us like, time to relax and mm -hmm. decompress mm -hmm. and then when he was home he was like a ticking time bomb I wouldn't go so far as to say he's a rageaholic but frustration explosions all the time because of the pressure he had put on himself and then expectations he had on us and then you know felt loss of control of raising kids and being gone half the time mm -hmm. and, and so as you were talking I was just like I've been in self-reflective mode for so long as well because psychology is a passion but also I was an actor at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I was for so many reasons, but once you get into the business of, you know, and you're not just a kid anymore getting paraded around your, the town by your mom <clears throat> and with your mom and with that safety, um, the rejection fits in. And so you start to explore like, well, how, what's, what am I doing to try to please these other people? What, mm -hmm. you know, and so I've been self-reflecting and dealing with rejection and trying to figure out why I am, um, 
chameleon becoming what I think other people want me to be, you know? Oh, this book was perfect. Oh my this God. Good life. <laughs> yeah. So many levels. Yeah, and it's, isn't it amazing, nice, it's a great set of social skills to be able to shape shift just a little bit, to put others at ease, to create a welcoming experience, but there's a great cost mm -hmm. in that. And if you're doing it early, so when we're young, we're supposed to be figuring out who we are. And am I punk rock? Am I rock and roll? Mm -hmm. Like what, what, like, you know, not that you are the music that you listen to, but you try on a lot of different things. That's what we want our kids, you know, to do is to try on, to figure out, to explore. And I'm afraid like all of us are at some level, helicopter parents and Zamboni parenting, just kind of smoothing out the, the, the ice in front of them. So they have a nice glide. And that's why we're seeing such a rise in all of the negative consequences for children right now, like suicides on the rise, addictions on the rise, anxiety, depression, fill in the blanks. The, oh, how about this before I get to my point? The loneliest segment of the population used to be 65 and above, mm. which made sense. Kind of the retirement age, your friend group is starting to kind of, you know, hunker down and maybe some are dying. And so like, it kind of made sense. Loss of purpose if you are yeah. not doing anything. That's right. Yeah. And then, um, so they feel a sense of loneliness. The loneliest age group now is 14 to 21. Mm. And, the mo and that's always been the most fragile age group. So now you've, you now know, they're lonely. Yeah. Like it's, Terrifying. yeah, it's, so it's really quite scary. So if at a young age, if your, your job is to figure out identity versus role confusion is kind of one, one of the great theorists Eric Erickson suggested. Figuring out your identity or you end up, if you don't, you end up being very confused about your role in the world. And that lasts to about 21. So if you are exceptionally good at something at a young age, maybe you're attractive or you're really smart. So I picked those two in particular. It could be sport, it could be arts. But just those first two, you had nothing to do with the way you look. You had nothing to do with your intelligence. And when the world sees you for something you had nothing to do, it's a very complicated landmine of who am I. That's why we know from science we don't tell our kids, um, hey, you're so smart, because they had nothing to do with it. And then they, they, they can't actually flex it. They can work hard. So if you say, I see you working as hard as like, wow, I'm so like amazed by how hard you work. And of course you're gonna get good grades. Like, but I'm not talking about the outcome and I'm not talking about the, a God-given or a family-given yeah. gift, but we point to the things that they can enhance. It ends up being a little bit easier of a path for them, but that's secondary to what I'm, <laughs> the long way I'm getting to my point is that when we're really good at something at a young age and we get lots of attention for it, we develop what's called a performance-based identity. I am what I do, and I am what I do relative to how well I do it. And I am what I do relative to how well I do it relative to you. So then if I'm doing really good next to you, then I feel pretty good about me. And now my identity is based on that thing, whether it's sport or arts or acting or whatever it might be. And now every time I go on set, my entire identity is at risk. Every time I go to a social event, my entire identity is at risk. And that's too much to carry. Mm -hmm. That's not right. As opposed to you think of all the all of the greats. Like who who inspires you, Kelly? Like when you think oh, of Michael Jordan. You told that that story oh, about Carl yeah. Malone and I'll tell you a story <laughs> yeah. real quick or later, but as a it was rumored that he was retired. I was a senior in high school or no, I was a freshman in college. And my uh, the the Bulls were playing the Utah Jazz, and I had Jordan's like everything, like the oh, wings, did. the life size poster at the end of my hall that I would kiss on the way to school. No, like what, what was what was it about way. Jordan? Just his like unbelievable skill and talent, obviously, and then hard work, smile. I mean, he, I just thought he was the most beautiful human I've ever seen, and just and I love sports. I'm a sports junkie. Oh, like, fun! And so, did you play? Uh, I played soccer. You did mostly. Mm -hmm. I play tennis now, and um, but I like love football. I love. I used to go to NBA basketball games and sit on the floor. Like I yeah. just love competition. And Very sports. cool. Yeah. And so, um, <clears throat> all of that to say, my favorite human slash player was rumored to retire, and I had never seen a game. 
so my cousins lived in Salt Lake City and worked at the Delta Center. So this is, I mean, this is how brazen I am in some areas of life, and then so cowardly when it comes to FOPO, you okay. know. But I, my dad is a pilot, as I mentioned, so I flew standby to Salt Lake City, stayed for free with my um, cousins, used my cousin's Delta Center pass. She wasn't scheduled to work that day, so her name wasn't for the credentials. I snuck into the Delta Center <laughs> two hours go. before. Go, right? I'm, at 19 years old, I just there walk right in, wearing her pass, and I hid in the bathroom for two hours till the game started, and ended up seeing no. him <laughs> on <laughs> game six, winning the freaking game. That, ga that <laughs> game that I talk about in the book? Yes. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah. Oh, that is so Isn't fun. Isn't that wild? Yeah. So, so how, how much of the fun of that is the actual game and how much was the electricity around sneaking and like doing something that is, you know, boundary pushing? Yeah. For me, I've always been about, I've always been like, if it's not harming anyone, I'm going to find the easiest way in to yeah. bring the most joy to my life. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, and so, yeah, it was both the thrill and the danger of it, but mm -hmm. also like. I did. I was so obsessed that it was just not even an option. Like I was gonna make. I will, I will scale the wall if I had to. You know what I love about that story is that um, I was working with a special operator, and um, in, in Navy SEALs, and he paused our conversation and he said, "Mike, when something matters, when something really matters to you, you'll do whatever it takes." And we're talking about loving relationships, and. That idea that when something really matters, whether it's seeing Michael Jordan play, you know, whatever, or a child that's in harm, or a loved one that needs you, or a purpose that's bigger than you, mm -hmm. you'll do whatever it takes. When something really matters to you, and I do think a rite of passage for adulthood is to figure out what really matters to me. And if we don't do that, we end up living life according to what they want us to be. And the they could be shape magazine it could be the neighborhood narrative of what you know women or men or whatever are supposed to be or it could be um the the family heritage of like where a woman or a man falls in line and what's expected like at, in this family we mm -hmm. and if it's about role and and i if it's about role um then versus like character so there's a difference in the way family narratives can go the way we do things here is we're honest and this and that. Mm -hmm. It's about character. Then you can inhabit those characteristics in any role. But if it is about role, look, we are politicians. We are what actors. We are what fill in the blanks. It comes a little more complicated. But if we get to my main point, is if I think it's a rite of passage to adulthood to figure out what am I doing here? What is my purpose? And the tricky part is like, did you take a class on how to fill, figure out your purpose? No. Yeah all of that studying at one of the great universities across the planet and they don't help us no. same with all of my schooling I didn't have it's a it's a simple process but it's quite complicated mm -hmm. to sort out of all the words in your native tongue which ones do you want to put together to articulate what you're going to do with your time here and it almost becomes overwhelming so we inhabit the roles that people expect of us rather than the ones that we want. Mm -hmm. And even now that I like I'm doing the Heal with Kelly podcast, I did the film, I did the book, like I still wouldn't know that I'd be even able to define my purpose because I have so many like interests and I guess like maybe I'm an investigator, I'm a seeker and then I want to share what I learn along the way with others like at the very basic level. Yeah, so know. part part of purpose like okay, so let's do the science real quick. Okay. Um, it's there's only three legs to the stool and then I'll, I'll maybe give a way that has helped me clarify my purpose and what I do with other folks if that's of interest yes it is okay so there's three legs according to science to the stools of a purpose um, it has to matter to you so somebody can't give you their give you your purpose it has to really matter to you whatever this thing is um, it has to be bigger than you so you, you can't solve it alone you're part of something that is bigger. And that, that is really important as, as one of the legs. Because you, you get put in place. Like solving world hunger, let's say. <laughs> you're, not, you're not gonna do it by yourself. Or like, what, fill in the blanks. Whatever it is, it just needs to be bigger than you and matter to you. Those are the first two. And the third leg to the stool is that there's a horizon to it. So it's not something solved today. 
It's something that you're you're on an adventure of. You're on a mission for. So it's those are the three legs to the stool. And it can change. You don't have to get a neck tattoo of it. Like you can change it at any point. But what that ends up doing is it puts you as part of the coral reef. You are not the coral reef, which is what we tell our kids. Like, you know, like you are part of it. You are part of something far bigger that matters. And if you think about Mandela, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Eleanor Roosevelt, you think about some of the greats. They, their purpose was clear. Like if Jesus was here and we said, hey, Jesus, what's your purpose? And he'd be very clear, wouldn't he? Yeah. Oh, it's about love. Are you kidding me? You know, if Buddha was here and he says, and we were to say, what's your purpose? He said, oh, loving kindness. Like, really, that's what we're trying to do. Loving kindness. Kelly and Mike, are you meditating on loving kindness? Are you doing the work? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Master, so, yes, yeah, Master. Right. yes, yeah. So like, so the, when the purpose is clear, they move rooms. And some of those rooms are small, small rooms, and some are huge rooms. And some of the rooms are like global. Mm -hmm. And that's not available just for them. That's available for us too. Okay, so those are three legs to the stool. You could just kind of marinate in those three you could hydrate those three in three forms write about it so get your journal out and say what really matters to me what's something that's really big that I want to be part of and if you just if you just got pages down mm -hmm. and started writing there's an honesty in f people are more honest with their journals than with their therapists which is a weird thing yeah you're paying a lot of money to go sit with a learned <laughs> that's person true. that's gonna listen and try to understand you and people are more honest in their right. journals because you know when you're BSing. And okay, all that being said, so that's one, journaling, meditating is a third practice to get clear, creating that space to go, oh, oh, okay. And then the third is conversations with people of wisdom about things that matter. So those are the three best practices. And I'll give you one more here, is when you close your eyes, and you create a little bit of space. I'm not talking about meditation. And you use your imagination to think about what a better future, a compelling future would be. It's your own imagination. And, and sometimes you got to spend a lot of time here. But what is an amazing future? And it could be about you and your family. That could serve. Or it could be about you and humanity. It could be about you and your neighborhood. What, what it, it, Size, and it doesn't matter, but like, when you think about an amazing future, what starts to surface? And then that would inform what matters to me, mm. right? So those, so those are, I just gave you a handful. I'm happy to say any of them again, <laughs> but like that would be what would be considered a best practice to get going on purpose. And once you have your purpose, once you know, those are the most powerful people on the planet because once you really know, no external environment will dictate your internal experience. You're like, I'm on a mission. Do you want to be part of it? I'm really excited about this, mm -hmm. Kelly. Like, I want to share something that's really important. You know, do you have any time? Do you have any money? Do, do you have any people, you know, that might want to be part of this? No, no, no. Okay, no problem. What is yours? Uh, I don't know. Well, come on, come with me. Like, let's just do this for a little bit. So that that's where, like, that's where this energy comes from. When you're around people that vibrate, it's not, they, they could still be, struggling in some parts of their life but when there's a vibrance about a person it typically c falls in line with some clarity that they have mm -hmm. and what i just gave is a handful of ways to get more clear that's huge that's great it's yeah. true because when you have your purpose your motivation your drive and it's meaningful mm -hmm. and it's for the collective and in service which is back to our connection to nature and, and why we're here um, so nature's nature's important for you. Nature's important for me. I think mm -hmm. it's why we're so sick is because we've become so disconnected from nature. And you talk about it in heal. your book. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, sick mentally, sick as a community, as a society, as you know, systems are are sick. You know, because of this disconnected disconnection from nature. And you talk about it in the book. Yeah. And also, like, I feel like, how do we? It's fear of other people's opinions, but it's also kind of fear of our poor opinion of ourself. Like, how do we strengthen our, mm. if we have the parents that we did? I mean, I've done so much work. And 
you talk about in the book um, how, and we've all heard a version of this. It's like when, you know, I forget the woman's name, but she works with people dying in the hospice. Mm-hmm. And so she wrote a book about their biggest regrets or their, you know, mm-hmm. and, you know, basically the conclusion is most people regret not having the courage to live the life they wanted and they just lived a life to, for the approval of others. When you read that, what was that like for you? Well, I was, A, it inspired me, like lit a fire under my ass, but B, the fire's been lit because I'm 45 and I feel like women, especially, you know, whether it's like after they've had children or if they've never had children and they just hit 40 and their hormones start to change or they're just like, holy shit, half the life's over. So time starts to matter a little bit more. Yeah. Like for me, 45, like I still can have children and I still want to have children, but I'm like, I can't, I can't, like I gotta figure this out, you know? Yeah. And so that time pressure is making me that impact, that statement has so much more impact because I'm like now, you just, and then I look at the people who are like 60, 70 years old in my life and they just, they don't tolerate any bullshit because they know that their time is more precious than the people. So it's just lit a fire under my ass and like make me put blinders on. So I just become more efficient in my that's, life. That's what, so that's so rad because that's, that's what purpose will do. It's also what, when you get honest with the fragility of life, like, life is really fragile and you start to recognize just how fragile it is when you lose people and that can happen young but it tends to have you know old people die more than young people Mm -hmm. right and so we don't get the luxury of this lesson of grief until we're much older which is a forcing function for like hey what are you doing here Mm -hmm. like really how are you spending your time and i there's a first principle i work from which is that through relationships we become and it's the relationships first with yourself, then with others, with mother nature, with experience itself. And I'm adding with machines, <laughs> like mm-hmm. I think it's coming. But um, to answer your point, like how do we be better with ourselves? Part of it begins with a decision, a fundamental decision that I matter. And if you're really struggling and you hear that, you're like, I don't know if I do. Like that's someone who's really suffering. If someone's struggling and it's, and you hear that, like, do you matter? And you go, yeah, I do. But like, there's so much stuff that's not going right. Okay. So it starts with a fundamental decision that I'm going to back myself. Maybe you didn't have anyone that saw you that really saw you and backed you. So the fundamental decision is I'm going to take care of me. How do you do that? Well, there's all these self-care practices. Those are all really good for lots of reasons. But the way you fundamentally back yourself is the way you speak to yourself. Mm. And if you thought about just oversimplifying psychology, self-talk, if you will, for just a moment, there's a bucket, two buckets. Buckets, uh, thoughts that land in one bucket are, they create constriction and tightness. And there's another bucket that creates space and openness. And so the thoughts that back us that back yourself are ones that create some space inside of you. The ones that, I don't know, like they're they're questions like, am I okay here? Does my hair look okay? What do they think of me? Uh, Am I going to blow it? Like, don't screw up. All those things create tension some kind of way. And so if you just oversimplified it and you got into a place like, listen, fundamental commitment, I'm going to back myself. I'm going to be a great coach to myself. I'm going to be a great parent to myself. I'm going to be a great friend to myself. And then you became incredibly aware of the way you speak to yourself and you started to slide your types of thoughts over to that bucket that created space to explore, to love, to be friendly to yourself, to really back yourself. I think it's a a radical commitment to everyone that you know, because you're no longer looking to them to take care of you. It's not their job. You're, you're making a commitment to take care, to take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. It's so true. I'm going to, I, I, I feel like I'm just at this place in my life where I have this tremendous need to step forward in fearless authenticity cool. and just be radically me and trust that like my community will show up if, if I get canceled in some way or break up a relationship or whatever it is that the fear Are, are you afraid of, of being canceled? I, you know, I'm not. I, I feel but like. But there's a conveyor belt now. 
Yeah. And for folks in the media to that it's like a it it's a pretty fast conveyor belt for cancel. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, probably I mean, probably secretly hopes I get canceled. No, I'm kidding. But you know what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> no, what does that mean? That's pretty funny. What does that mean? Like, if you, and I could just like there's a go freedom on vacation for yeah. Oh, that is my so daughter funny. And yeah. Sleep in and you know yeah. do all these things. I'm kidding, but I I just um, it's more an association with other people, like family members and stuff, like but. It's not even about that. I wait, think- wait. You know, you know what? I, okay, I love where you're going because you're talking about just I want to go be me mm-hmm. and be it, like bold with how I'm going to be me. Yeah. And and have you faced that idea that to do that it would mean that you'd need to be incredibly vulnerable, on the edge of falling apart a thousand times into a thousand pieces. Like that's the part. That's where FOPO keeps us together, mm-hmm. as opposed to being messy like i'm i'm gonna make a fun i'm a, back to this phrase fundamental commitment mm-hmm. to just whatever is for coming up or happening that i'm gonna bring that forward and that's hard to do it's really hard to do because there why would we not do it because of what other people will think of us mm-hmm. after it's done or even sometimes they're in the you know with us like you know critique us in that moment mm-hmm. and that's not safe so the reason we have FOPO, you have it and I have it, is because our brain is hundreds of thousands of years old, 400 to 250, depending on kind of what math you look at. But mm-hmm. that's a long time, and the brain hasn't changed all that much. So when the brain was really forming in a pretty aggressive way, safety, which is its job, is belonging. And you think about a pack of sheep, the sheep in the middle are much safer from the wolves. And so belonging, like in the eyes of others, was safety. Mm-hmm. So if I could just find out how to be safe in front of other people, I'll, I'll be okay. So don't don't fall apart now. Don't be the weak one. Don't be the one that points out where the, the problems are. You know, don't be an agitator too much because there, you get pushed out. Mm-hmm. Truth is now, <laughs> to your point, that there's um, there's people that... Um, the tribes are not as small as they once were. And you've got your tribe. You've got your community somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do. Yeah. I've, yeah. And, oh my gosh, there's so many. It, it is, and I, and I realize, it's so funny. What's happening in my life right now is um, everything is stripping away and showing me that everything that I've searched for externally for safety is kind of like crumbling yeah and so it's forcing me to look to make that commitment and back myself not and i'm not talking like materially or anything like that i'm talking like just seeking safety through other people's approval or you know the perception of what i do or who i'm with or any all any and all of it like so many areas are are crumbling right now and i feel and like as something as simple as getting a puppy like I was already at max capacity and then my daughter's like I want a puppy my husband's like yes and then two months later I'm like holy shit like I don't have time for a puppy it's another life it's like a child it's keeping me up like the the universe God yeah. spirit my higher self whatever you want to call it is creating the circumstance to just break me into submission so that I finally let go of control and it's, it? it's you know and yeah in, and I'm so aware, thank God, because otherwise I'd be having mental breakdown, that I can go, okay, and it's actually like giving me the space to kind of laugh and go, okay, I get it, I get it, like, uh, uncle, you know? Mm. And um, it's just it's just so cool when you can start to, so I guess, I guess like, what is your, like, view perception of life perspective on life that you feel is the most productive or healthy to have the most empowering to have like what is your yeah that's a cool question um i would probably go back to like do the big work you know purpose and start there and you're probably closer than you think you know you've really put some time and energy in a very clear narrative that and community that you're building you're probably it probably just hasn't 
landed in the sentence or two, you know, or the word or two. I, I would say like that would be, that's like the big rock to get in the container. And then the other stuff like that really does help is being around people that are really inspiring, that bring energy and clarity in, they have it for themselves. Um, it's really infectious when we're connected to other people that see us mm -hmm. and um, value being alive you know, vibrantly alive. So that that's, and, but that you can't, you can't just go find them. You have to first be it. Yeah. And then when you are that on a regular basis, like there's a, there's this in sport, there's a phrase game recognizes game. And it's like rap meets, you know, the urban culture meets sport game recognizes game. A master recognizes another master, somebody who's vibrant in life recognizes somebody else who's vibrant. And then you end up kind of coalescing you know with each other so that's that's the second one just like really invest in that brilliant light inside of you and other people are attracted to that mm -hmm. and then how do you maintain the sense of vibrance how do you sustain it recovery practices and that's where sport has so much to offer us yes it's concrete yes it's, it's like um, human made rules at some point that are really kind of silly you know, yeah. we don't need sport other than entertainment, <laughs> you know, and this is, I'm careful because this is the industry I've spent yeah, yeah. so much with. <laughs> but like, if there's a, if there's a, like the world, world three happens, like I'm, we don't need sport. Mm -hmm. It's a great release valve. It is so much fun. And there's so much that we can learn from that laboratory. One of them is that, I'll go back to fundamental commitments. They make a fundamental commitment every day to be vulnerable in front of their peers, in front of their coaches. Um, they take risks in front of people that want to take their jobs in practice. I'm not talking about game day. I'm talking about practice where it sounds like an Allen Iverson quote. Sorry, <laughs> <I love laughs> just nar narrative in my head. But they, they're taking, they're courageously being vulnerable every day to try something that they're not very good at. Mm -hmm. That's how learning happens. So there's a fundamental commitment to, that they can teach us there. And the second one is the importance of recovery. So they work really hard incredibly hard physically and emotionally uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and they have a full-time staff to help them recover now maybe you can have a full-time staff to help <laughs> you recover but but it's I think it's really important that we take that lesson and say how do I recover properly so I can do it again tomorrow and again tomorrow and I think my community is inspired and, and tired I think I think they're both mm. And trying to figure out that tired piece, I think, is a real thing for, for most of us. Ugh, I feel seen. <laughs> inspired and tired? <laughs> inspired and tired. Yeah. Um, so funny. I, I play tennis, and that's my new, like, obsession. And I played in high school. And it's and I on a recent podcast, I kind of voiced that I wish my parents had pushed me into doing one thing. Because I was good at everything. So I played Var three varsity sports. I was ASP president. I was like the well-rounded mm. chick, you know, and <clears throat> and acting and all these things. So I had a great resume, but I was like, I had aspirations to like win the Oscar and be the Olympian, and I wanted to be great. And I was just like really good at everything. And we we won, you know, CIF and our wow. soccer team was great and club yeah, and traveled yeah, everywhere. Yeah. But our coaches were kind of like we had attitudes and like we kind of ran our coaches we didn't have the coach that was pushing us either so we just coasted through on talent and fun basically mm -hmm. but that only got us so far and then we were and so I voiced that and my mom kind of got offended she's like Kelly you were so hard on yourself if I had pushed you at all like you would have broken you oh, know yeah. and so it's like oh mom I'm so sorry like I didn't mean to offend you but um <laughs> But so all I'm saying is in this awakening that I've had in my early 40s and wanting to like really just be authentic and step in, feel empowered myself and focus less on the external and the performance and the accolades and more of finding safety within. Um, I went from playing doubles, safe, yeah. always have someone else Partner. to yes. point the finger to yeah, or right. take or take care of care, the slop when half, you're a mess. Yeah, yeah when, right. you're, when you're mm -hmm. terrible, like they can hold you up um, and I played doubles in, in number one doubles in, in high school mm. but like I'm fast like I have the skill set to play singles it's I just hid behind safety and I think it was because my father was so highly critical and, and I remember my biggest trigger was 
not wanting people to think I was stupid. And I equated stupid with making a mistake or failing because the milk couldn't spill in our house or it was an explosion. So now in the last few months, I'm playing singles. And not only singles, I play upper level singles. Um, and, and it's all about mindset. And I'm just like, grow up, Kelly. It's here now. And I'm watching Djokovic and how he can like get back into the game. It's mental. I'm listening to Federer yeah, and right, his graduation right. speech. Yeah. And I'm like, it's not just, so it's just a battle between me and my mind. It's not even about the other girl. It's just like, thank you for giving me the exercise to know myself deeper and be able to like be in the present moment. Yes. And, you know, I'm not going to win every match, but I have been winning and I've been digging deep and I'm like the self worth that I'm building because I'm taking a risk and, and removing that childhood baby thing that I've been carrying my whole life of like, oh, well, you know, I don't want to make a mistake in front of people because mm-hmm. I'll think I'm stupid. I was like, no, I know I'm intelligent. Fuck that. That's, That's like cool. an old belief, Isn't you know? That great? Yeah. And so, and I'm yeah. learning, and I want you, you, to. Like, everything just changed yeah. in you when you said it. Yeah. Even. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. so good. The F word. No. Um, <laughs> but, anyways, it's so empowering, is what yeah. I'm saying, when you get to a point where you want to back yourself and you, and I'm just like, I'm just like ready to grow up at 45 years old. I think that what you just said is way more common than you might imagine. You know, like, at what point do you feel like you are a matriarch or do you feel like you're a woman and versus a child to your parents, even though they're not running your household? Like it's, it's complicated because, um, the family structure is so different, but that idea of being like a full adult, it's not clear how to do that. No. <laughs> and if it, the, the shorthand is, well, if I get a bunch of attention and a la power and or money from doing something really well, that is what's called a performance based identity that we're talking about kind of almost in minute one. And that flip from a performance based identity, I am what I do and how well I do it relative to you, that, that if you can go from that approach to a performance based identity, this is that is I am part of something bigger and I just want to I I'm inspired by it. So it, so that bigger part, I, it feels like, I don't love the word, but it's like empowerment. There's something about that. And I'll tell you why I don't love the word is because not of what it means, but how it's used. Like, I am going to help empower you. I don't want somebody to help empower me. I, I, I already, I already know that there's power in me. So it's not up to uniting me. There's some something that is not squaring with that hasn't squared with me since that framing was introduced in a popular way a handful of years ago. I, I want partners that see me. I want people that support me and challenge me, but not like they have the power and they're going to empower me. I don't. There's something that doesn't square right with me. And I think what you're saying that I hear you saying is like. No, I have power inside of me. What am I going to do with all this power when I finally step into it? Like I'm no longer apologizing for trying to look smart or pretty or whatever. Like I'm good. There's something deeper that I'm trying to get to, which is actually a freedom that I'm okay without having success or failure to, to, to mark my sense of being okay. Mm. And if you can get into that place and, I don't know. You, I think you just travel a little bit more gracefully through life and you can help other people do the same. As you said that, it was like ease freedom, for you. Yeah. Without having to prove or do or be or anything to, like to, to tap into that innate power and innate value within us all. <sighs> just ease, which is the opposite of disease. Yeah. Which uh, is, you know, disease, literally disease, yeah. disease. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's good play. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, there's, um, it was on, on the, uh, finding mastery podcast and there was a conversation I was having and it was with the world's best where they said, you know, I'm tired of trying to be more and do more. And like, I don't need to do the extraordinary to be extraordinary. Oof. When I heard that, I was like, oh, there it is. I don't need to do something to be okay. What I need to do is I need to be more, more creative, more present, more kind to self and others, more connected, more free. I need to be all of those and then let the doing flow from that standpoint. And when that happens, 
like it, the entire model is flipped upside down. And when that happens, like, I think that that's the good life. Mm, yeah. And when I listen to your podcast, it's like, I think we're doing the same thing. We're trying to help ourselves and our people live a great life. Yeah. Like, what is a great, I want to live a great life. And that to me, it's not defined by like the wealth is the modern wealth is not money in the bank. That's wonderful. It's like energy and vibrance and connected and like a aliveness. That's what I think the new beauty is. It's not, it's not, you know, what, what's happened to my jowls. Yeah. What's yeah. Happened to my, the wrinkles <laughs> around I my eyes. In the mirror, <laughs> yeah. Like, Gosh, yeah. Gravity. I, yeah. I know gravity. What's happened? <laughs> Elastis. Yeah. yeah. Like, my wife is um um we're we were married uh high school sweethearts got yeah. married young she's we're both the same age 52 and she's on a very similar passion that you have which is like i'm gonna tell the truth i don't know if anyone's gonna like it but it's gonna be a adventurous kind of creative you know she's english second language uh, immigrant family and she's like i'm tired of this game and she's doing it publicly She's built a blog, a vlog around it, yeah. which is like, there's so much freedom when you're like, I'm just going to, fundamental commitment, I'm going to be honest and kind. Yeah. If you can put those two together, it's pretty radical. Mm -hmm. And you even mentioned in your book, like the curiosity piece is so key right now. That's the antidote for the device. Like you have whole chapters in here about how to, mm. to, to actually seek out the opposite of what you believe, you know, because, um, and seek out the opposite of what you believe what is that, you believe like the opposite yeah, opinion that's right you know, like and it's the clearest example is obviously politics, politics and just be like but how you know i don't even want to polarize anybody on this so i will keep my opinions to myself you, no it's already polarizing yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah like but i remember two years ago um my family is a little bit divided in politics my parents are on one camp and my brother's on the other camp and i'm kind of in the between and um, and I said, you guys are invited to our house in Michigan, but Politic, you, no politics. politics are off the table yeah. unless you guys are able to come to the dinner table or the boat with curiosity and compassion. That's it. Like that was the theme. So we just, that's, that's just, awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's so hard because have, like it triggers something so primal, which is both parties both people at your dinner table, let's both family members mm -hmm. probably want the same thing, like a better future for our kids, yeah. you know, and like capture the, a, a, a vehicle that can help deliver that to the next generation. And they're so wildly different in many approaches that it's super complicated. I know, but you make so much sense in the book because you said when someone um, has the opposite opinion, you know, let's take politics, it's so intense, it's so triggering because it's not just an attack on your belief. Your belief is like collapsed onto your identity. That's so it. it's an attack. It's a threat to a your actual identity. identity yeah. Your actual and that's why like everybody's so like up in arms. Yeah, right. Which made so much sense. I know. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think you're right. The anecdote is to, is to be more curious. And that's really hard to do if you're anxious or frustrated. Mm -hmm. So practicing being curious is one of the, meditation practices yeah oh look that thought came up oh i wonder where that came from oh it came from there that's interesting let me follow that without judging or critiquing it and if you that's called like a contemplative meditation yeah. if you set a timer for i don't know six minutes 20 minutes whatever whatever you know if my first teacher was here he'd be like why are you saying counting minutes <laughs> just do the work mike but if you if like in a in a very practical sense you said i'm just going to follow my thoughts and emotions I'm going to kind of mark them and name them without judging or critiquing. And I'm going to see where thought one, how it leads to thought two. And so you're practicing curiosity for yourself. Mm -hmm. you're, you're training to be able to do it with others. If you don't practice, you can't do it with other people, yeah. especially when it's an emotionally charged, you know, conversation. Yeah. I want to share, because again, the safety thing and the control, like I had such a powerful experience that happened last weekend i forgot what day we are right now yeah so a few a few days ago and i was recording a podcast at my michigan house and i gave birth to my child five years ago mm. i used to be a runner <clears throat> and and i run not competitively but i did two marathons but i ran to get 
solitude and inspiration and endorphins really like oh, i just yeah. got out on the road yeah. you know used to run down san vicente training for a marathon just gave me like the framework that i had to give that my solitude time mm. myself solitude so and inspiration and i get like downloads when i run it's just a cool experience and so i haven't had that for six years and not only has it been an intense six years collectively but also like raising an infant and all, all of those new things so i haven't had my escape slash you know self thing of running for six years <clears throat> so i'm running the new york marathon in november wow so i'm like putting Congrats. a time pressure yeah. thing on myself okay. i've kind of dabbled in healing my pelvic floor the reason i haven't run is because i went back to tennis too early and mm. my pelvic floor didn't yep. heal properly <clears throat> and so when i run this is very human i hope nobody gets gross out about it but i just leak urine mm -hmm. and it, there's no pain it's gotten better over time i've tried pelvic uh, all the things yep and um and so now i'm just like fuck it i trust my body knows how to Oh, cool. figure out the last thing I'm just gonna start running so first time I ran just like urine all down the legs mm, wearing black leg and mm. super humiliating but I was just like I, my need to run and like overcome this and like figure this out is more than whatever people think if it's sweater pee or whatever and then it got better the next time but I'm still like it's still an issue and so I'm kind of going okay well I gotta listen to my body I don't want to push myself but Long story short, interview this guy, Rob Worgen, who's an energy healer. He was in Heal, and he's a dear friend of mine. And so we were talking about, so he did a healing on me, and he, we were, but we were talking about expectation and does it matter the people's belief that's getting healed and, you know, because he doesn't want to know the condition or anything he's healing. He's just channeling whatever mm, mm. energy is meant for mm. your body. Anyways, the next day after the thing, oh, he also said, you know, it's also about being grateful for, he's like you have to be grateful for everything and and a lot of people you know and so i would ask the guides like i would get so frustrated like some people heal some people don't what what is it about the people that don't hmm. you know the, the not healing is it belief or what is it and so the guides told him spoiler alert i don't know when this is going to come out in relation to his podcast yeah. but it's such a powerful experience and it's about control and safety um said it's the second and third thought so like you say your affirmation or you say your gratitude like i am beautiful in the mirror i am healthy or i'm so grateful that you know i got the promotion of the job whatever you're mm -hmm. being grateful for and desiring um but then the second and third thought we don't monitor and those are the things that creep in so it's that practice of like being aware of your thoughts great and and start to practice that awareness and then you can start to layer on deeper levels of that affirmation and gratitude and so being grateful for the lesson being grateful for everything so i'm really trying to like have that space in my life for these little things that are continue to like pile up and pressure just being grateful and in trust and surrender that there is a reason and there's a there's a flow that's trying to send me in a direction rather than resist and wish it was a different way just like breathe and just like allow the experience to happen um, rather than try to control everything so next morning i go out to run start to trickle and i'm like wow well, you know of course it's not like i'm expecting i have attachment to the outcome you know and then i was like no just gratitude so i was just like okay I'm, I'm grateful that it's improving and that's true and then i'm paying attention to the second and third thought and you know there's a little doubt creeping in i'm just like you know what it's true that i'm grateful that it's improving is it then i heard the word lesson a le it's about the lesson mm -hmm. and then i was like oh all of these pressures that I've become aware of and then the puppy is like the straw that broke the camel back that I just can't control everything anymore. I have to let go. I just have to let the puppy pee places. I have to be, you know, all everything, just let everything fall apart and just like do my best, you know? And, and this, like the bladder not having any control, the physical is like always shows up in the physical last. I'm like, this is the lesson. I just, if, if I'm going to try to continue for 45 years, control everything in life so that people control other people's opinions of me, yeah. control my safety through finances, all of the control, the public's perception of me by monitoring my truth, whatever it is, like eventually the, the world's going to, the universe is going to, the energy, the universal energy, God's divine spirit is going to win. And so it just, it went down to the physical, like you are not in control. <laughs> and so I finally was like, oh okay yeah. i can let go and i got the lesson and i shit 
or P U not. I don't pee anymore. It's like a tiny trickle oh at the beginning God. of the run, and then it's done. I, <laughs> so I promise so you, it's the most mind blowing thing, but it's about control, yeah. and it's physically showing up as like the the last lesson to smack me over the head. Come and be on. Like, Let go. Yeah. Wow. Trust That's pretty rad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Contr like the it sounds so easy to let go but um you know those mechanisms for control are there for safety and it, it's it's kind of like the harder you squeeze um the more the hard, the the more difficult it becomes and so it's not easy to do what so bravo like huge congratulations on being as hard-headed as, as you've been for the last 40 years. <laughs> so it's going to take, you know, my pelvic floor to say, hey, you know, pay attention here. Yeah, yeah I, I had a moment where I, I did an ultra and um, it was uh, supposed to be six and a half hour event and it turned into eight and a half hours. And um, I was properly fit for it, but I ran into an emotional um, well that was like, whole, what is happening? and hallucinations and things were happening. And so it was, I, I'll spare you the long story, but I got to the end of it and it was so freeing. My mentor said to me, yeah, Mike, that should teach you about just how hard headed you are. You needed to go <laughs> like that far, that intense to knock off this calcium that you've been building up for the last 40 years. So, you know, um, I, th I celebrate what you're saying, like awesome. And it could be worse. Mm. So the fact that you got through it with something that's, you know, like not devastating, right. but uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. What a good lesson. It's such a good lesson. Let go. And that's that ease that you're coming back to of like just really finding that safety within with your innate power and value yeah. as a human life. And then to like have that freedom of going through life and, and welcoming all experiences and trusting that there's lessons and lessons and sometimes they're painful, and yep. sometimes, you know, but it's all, and then the last, so it's, it's that freedom and ease, I think is like what my purpose is heading towards, like discovering that for myself and then and sharing. sharing. Yeah, there you go. So yeah. there's a Zen parable. Um, that you know I'll, I'll get the most of it i'll get most of it correct in my reframing here is that there's a a, a master and a, and a and a student and um the master says good news or bad news and the student says good news he says um um he goes okay so wait hold on good good news or bad news bad news and the zen uh, teacher says uh, life is like falling through the air without anything to grab or hold on to Good news, there's no bottom. Mm. So like just figure, like th that idea that you shared has been around for thousands of years. There's nothing really to hold on to or to grasp. And it, that feeling of falling through with nothing to hold on to is very scary, it's very overwhelming. You can almost feel that panicky feeling if like you're falling off something and you wanna grab to, to hold on to not fall any further. But the good news is there is no bottom. So keep falling. Yeah, and then join hands with the people that How about it? know that too. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. okay. Ah! <laughs> We're, yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. Yeah, um, that's this has been so awesome. The last thing I'll say, because you mentioned it, is, you know, I like a group of friends and I had a very spiritual experience together, and we were, we were talking about how, <clears throat> like, I see you as the new I love you. Mm -hmm. And so my thing is that what I'm, this little season of growth and um, transformation that I'm in is like really like sitting with ourselves and seeing ourselves and bringing all the stuff that in the shadow that we've rejected, denied, judged in ourselves for so long and like holding it and holding our humanity. And so to f I'm working on like fully seeing myself and then I know I can like show up authentically in the world and in relationship so that I can be seen That's by exactly. others. That, that practice is a radical commitment mm -hmm. to love a self and love of others. Because when you go out into the world just a little bit more freely, you no longer are protecting your ego identity or needing something from somebody outside of you. It's one of the great mistakes is that life is good when people love me. It's actually the opposite is life is good when I have people to love. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it's a directional thing. So when you do that work, it is a radical commitment to do that work. And so, and you'll go places. You, you, you go to like dark places that are hard to sit with. And sometimes um, sitting alone is um, called for and sometimes sitting with other people that will guide you and just hold the space for you. And you're crying with your eyes closed and they're just, you know, helping you stay in that space. Like that can be a really cool way to deepen the practice as well. Mm, yes. Nice work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah very <So>. cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for this book. Oh, please. Well, what read a gift. it many, many times. Uh, I recommend you. it to everybody. First rule of mastery, <laughs> stop worrying about what people think of you. Thank you so much. And thank you for coming. Where can people find you? Yeah, and I mean, I think the, the easiest place is at the website, which is findingmastery.com. And you can find slash book or slash podcast. And there's a nice little morning mindset routine, um, an audio file that we have. I think it's pretty cool. And slash morning mindset. And we'll send it out to you. And it's like a way to start 90 seconds to a handful of minutes, a way to wake up particular parts of yourself and your, and your brain to give you a best chance to start the day off in, in the way that you'd like. So those are a couple ways. And social's fun, too. You know, that's all, all the handles are at Michael Gervais or at Finding Mastery. Awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to the Heal with Kelly podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. And make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. Oh, and if you found this episode inspiring, please rate, review, and share Heal with Kelly so that we can grow our audience and reach more people. We truly appreciate it. Lots of love.